Hello and welcome to today's webinar on the new City Green Living Wall System and Biodiversity in Action. Thank you for taking the time out today. Obviously, I have an interest in urban greening and living walls, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you some inspiring projects where this system has been used. Before we get into all of that, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping in today's schedule. So on your camera um, options, you just need to make sure that you've got everyone, view everyone ticked, and you can see myself and Angus, so you can see who's talking. Um, don't worry, you won't be able to see your cameras, just, just us. Today's webinar is gonna go for about an hour, um, depending on how many additional questions we get. I'm gonna start off introducing myself, quick rundown of City Green's history and company mission statement, before I introduce you to our UK and European partners, Scottscape and their CEO and founder, Angus Cunningham. Angus is gonna run you through biodiversity in action using our new living wall system. He's gonna talk about the benefits of living walls, how they can make such a difference in the built environment, increasing biodiversity, birds, bugs and bees, and a few relevant case studies. From there, we have a Q&A. We've got some pre-submitted questions, which I'll run through, through first, and then any further questions that come through on the chat, we can run through afterwards. So please do use the chat function. Just anything that pops into your mind while we're running through, just pop it in the chat and we can address that later. So my name is Grant Radbourne. I've been working in the urban greening sector for over 10 years now, first in London with Scottscape and the Living Wall System we're introducing to you today, and the last few years here in Melbourne. Urban greening is something I'm really passionate about. I love how installing pockets of green infrastructure into our cities can completely transform a space. I love the health benefits that come with the increased biophilic design. I love installing the system. And I love the feeling you get when a project is completed and you've made a real difference to that space. When I heard the City Green bringing this product to Australia, I had to be involved. So City Green are a world leading supplier and installer of sustainable urban landscape solutions, including structural soil cells, tree root management systems, rainwater harvesting and aeration systems, and now living walls. From humble beginnings, a small family business starting with Ben Gooden, City Green has grown into become a global leader with offices in Sydney, Melbourne, the USA and Canada. Our innovative systems have been used on thousands of successful projects across the globe, but our vision remains powerfully simple a world where sustainable green space is in reach of every person every day, transforming quality of life by creating innovative solutions for healthier urban spaces. With that being said, and while we've been further refining our systems for the urban forest, we've also been scouring the world for the best way of bringing life to vertical walls. And we now bring to you what we believe is the smartest, most flexible, most advanced living wall system in the world. The product we're launching here today in Australia is the City Green Living Wall System. Developed by the University of Seville with research and development at the forefront, this is a global system tested to all extremes, from the frosty winters of Northern Europe to the hot, dry summers of Spain and the Middle East. Um, I'm just going to introduce you now to Angus Cunningham, the CEO and founder of Scottsgate Limited. I've had the pleasure of working with Angus um, back in London while I was installing and managing these living wall projects across the UK and Europe. So over to you, Angus. I'll just give you control. Thank you, Grant. Who thought it would have come to this? You left for foreign lands and now we're talking about what we were both passionate about. But thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, yes, I have a very grown up title of CEO and founder. It belies my age, although I don't look it. So no, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to be here today and thank you all for making time um, to attend. It's, it's 10 o'clock uh, London time and Grant, my um, the technology is struggling because I can't make the slides move. Uh, can you, um, you go oh, try here we now. Go. Right, seems to go. There we go. CEO and founder. Thank you very much. There's a slight delay on the... There is, but it should just go now. There you go. Okay. Uh, still not wanting to, to move. Can you move. Can you move down and press the arrow buttons on the bottom corner that highlight? There you go. Click those. There we are. Great. 
Hey, so yes, my um, uh, webinar, thanks for making time, Living Walls Biodiversity in Action. And I think it's a natural fit for City Green after they've got the technology of bringing trees into the built environment, which is our passion as well, that it's a natural progression to use a bit of technology to get plants to grow on the side of buildings. So before I talk in depth about Living Walls, as a little bit on biodiversity, it's our passion, it's entirely relevant in today's age with uh, climate change to the fore. So what is biodiversity? So you look it up in the dictionary, this is what you get. The variety of plant and animal life in the world or in a particular habitat, and for this webinar we're talking about the urban environment, a high level of which is usually considered to be important and desirable. Well, we're saying biodiversity displacement or lack of biodiversity is far more than just desirable, important, it's absolutely necessary. It's linked to climate change at a higher level. And with our growth in towns and congestion, we're pushing biodiversity out. So biodiversity is nature, that's what we're talking about. And I've got a slightly more holistic definition, which I think is, is much more real uh, on biodiversity. Biodiversity is the variety of all living things on earth and how they fit together in the web of life bringing oxygen, food, and countless other benefits. That's what we're talking about. That's what our passion is. We want to bring biodiversity into the built environment. So it's got a rather nice name, biodiversity displacement. Really, that is, we've pushed, we've eradicated it. And, and I did apologize to, to Grant earlier that I couldn't get a picture of the Melbourne cricket ground, but you're gonna have to do a Wembley, I'm afraid, for this for this image, even though I believe Multiplex then, then did another uh, uh, building over the top of the old uh, uh, stadium. But the, the point of this picture is not so much the stadium, it was taken in 1925 by the way, it's not so much the stadium which isn't quite finished, but it's the farm on the right hand side, it's the fields around the stadium, it's the trees in the foreground. And if you fast forward to when Multiplex took over and built an, an absolutely cracking stadium, it's not so much the stadium we're looking at, but look what's happened around and that's, that's what's happening. The, the population is increasing. There isn't a lot we can do about that. And they're going to live in the towns. London in 2050 will have an extra 3 million inhabitants. They're either going to go in and, and, and make the, the, the urban space more congested or they're going to spill out into the green belt. Well, whatever happened, if you're living in a city, the chances are your population is increasing. That's our football pitch. That's the, that's the pitch we're playing in. Now in the UK, we've got a little bit of light on the horizon. You know, from where we're coming from, we've seen a great growth in, in urban greening over the last four or five years. So the market is going there and that's right. Morally, it's right. We need to bring green and we all know that it, green is good um, and laws tend to, fo to follow. So, but at COP26, the environment bill was ratified. Now, it basically enshrines nature principles in law, but it's a key takeout for us, which is important for our market and that's biodiversity net gain. So the new ruling is, if you're gonna take a plot of land and put a building on um, or do a development, you've got to put back plus 10% biodiversity minimum. So that's fantastic for us. The difficulty is measuring biodiversity is really difficult. So we've, there's a new uh, a simple matrix being brought out. There are various matrices around which are incredibly complicated and open to interpretation. Developers tend to take the mickey. Here's a basic one. So the matrix that you see here in green and yellow is, is called the urban greening factor. And it's simple because it scores between zero and one. And in the UK, if you're gonna put a, a building up, you're gonna have to produce a particular score and that will be decided by the planners. So interesting to know if you can see the mouse moving, if you're gonna put a load of paving down, hard landscaping, which is impermeable, no points, zero, zero point, understandably. If you're going to get maximum point, which is one, trees, wetland, uh, species rich grassland, these are, this is what's counting. And if you look down here, we've got a 0 0.6 for a green wall. Oops, gone the wrong way. So a green, green wall is a, is a, is a 0.6. So interestingly, that's half the value of, a, of, a, of planting trees. So wouldn't it be great if we can plant trees on living walls? There's a bit of food for thought. So in Praise, what we do at Scottscape, we encourage biodiversity into urban places. That's our mission. That's, that's what we do. And we do it because 
as I said, populations moving into the cities. We need to make them more sustainable and healthier places to live, work and play. We don't want people going to the countryside. Go to the countryside to enjoy yourself. Come to the city to live. How do we do this? We've got to be resourceful and innovative. We've got a tough pitch to play on. We've, we've got cities that are built with the prime purpose of pushing water out to sea as quickly as possible to not have green apart from in parks. So we've got a pretty inhospitable environment uh, to green. And living, living walls are a really great way, it's a really good tool in the toolbox to help us achieve that. So uh, a, a brief, uh, a brief uh, history of my particular journey. I was, um, I don't sound it, but, I, but I've got a name Angus, it might be a giveaway. I was born in the borders of Scotland. This is a small village where I was brought up in. Uh, this is where I learned my love of nature. That was my back garden. I was born to two incredibly passionate amateur gardeners and I, I got my love of plants from them. That was my sc school holiday job, maintenance rounds in various villages in the locality. But at, at uh, 19, the bright lights of London lured me down and I managed to get a job as an apprentice at the Royal Hospital Chelsea where the Chelsea flower shows held. Um, I lasted a year. Um, before I joined the ranks of the self-employed with a garden maintenance round in Wimbledon and it was carrying the tools on my dad's old army kit bag on the, on the tube. And I was absolutely like a, like a pig in muck, absolutely loved it. Bought our first van in 1986, I think it was. Um, yes, it's been commented that this was the sort of van that Michael Caine would rob banks in and, and so it was, but that's, that's how old I've got. Um, but now I've got the very grown up title of um, CEO and founder and I've got uh, I'm at the head of a really passionate, um, I dare I say, young team. They're all in their mid-30s, so that is young to me, um, who are innovative and they love doing what they're doing. And guess what? We were all gardeners a long time ago. That's how I started. And that's not a particularly well-paid job. And this, this, is a, this is a moment when gardeners get to influence um, biodiversity. So very clever. And, and I mean, we, we're loving it. Anyway, enough of that. Let's get on to some living walls. So here's a, a, a little bit of a secret. This guy, Patrick Blanc, um, um, uh, I don't quite hear a worship but him, but he, uh, I've, got him, I've got him up here. He is from France after all. If it wasn't for him with his green hair and his green fingernails, our industry wouldn't be where it is now. Uh, Patrick is a French botanist and it, whilst uh, botaneering, in uh, Borneo, um, he he came across cliffs that were covered in plants, and he thought, "My God, this is amazing! What, why, why, how are they surviving? You've just got plants on rock face. Why don't we cover buildings with plants? This is entirely achievable." And he developed a, a fabric system, so where he, he would drape. This is his office, a picture on the left hand side, where he would drape fabric over buildings and apply a lot of water and put a load of plants. and And I love his methodology because he would put maybe 1400 different species of plant on a wall and say go so nature would then take over so survival of the fittest that's that's what happens in nature i think where the world we live in and particularly the living wall behind grant we've got to be a bit more contrived we, we we've got clients to achieve they don't want all messy and bare patches while, while plants compete but um i think the take out from this is he he designed a system to mimic of what happens in real life and our system is a more engineered uh, system to Patrick's it's a it's a fabric system and it'll, it'll make a little bit more sense in a minute so we've we've got some credentials um we've put up a lot of living walls in our time we've been involved since 2009 I think Grant Grant worked with us for five years up until 2016 before he had the misfortune of heading to Australia and trying to do the same thing but we can we can hoof you along now, Grant, with that with our, our living wall system. Uh, we've we've put a lot of meters in. We've learned a lot. We were at the front end. We we were involved in the first living wall that went into the UK in 2008. Um, we got a lot of knowledge, and we've developed a lot of knowledge and a lot of IP. But I thought the best way to to show you the versatility. Um, uh, of our wall is to I've put a series of clips together so if you'll forgive me I'll talk over it this is a, obviously a COP26 as you can see and you can be clever with living walls you can you can put some planting in to get a message across we don't always recommend that because it's um, they're designed our walls are designed for long-term plant growth 
But here you see a sacrificial one square meter of living wall, but we took the back out and look at the roots. This is what makes our system so special. The roots can grow throughout the whole wall. You know the old adage, healthy roots, healthy plants. And, and more than that, you get a big palette of plants. First job is to put a, a structure on the building and then you cover it with our fabric. You put the structure there to get a bit of airflow between the back of the living wall and the building. It's, it's, it's good practice rather than because our, our, our system is impermeable, but it's good to keep an air gap. And then really you're down to planting. Once you've got the irrigation in, uh, and, and here's the cost, because planting in the ground is probably the same as planting on a wall, plus the, the access equipment. So living walls are the price they are, nine times out of 10 because of the access equipment. And here's the finished product. And you can see some um, uh, bird boxes and insect boxes in the wall. And I went back about a month ago on a, on a gray and drizzly day to, to see how we were doing. They let me out of the office now and again. And I've got two meters depth of planting on the wall. What, what amazing um, cover for biodiversity. And then we thought, well, we're serious about bringing biodiversity and why don't we plant trees in the size of our living walls? So we've got a proof of concept going, which is uh, five years old now. And we've got five meter tall trees growing out of a porter cabin because the roots can spread throughout the whole system. And there's a series of shots now just showing, hey, planting in the ground's a bit old fashioned, right? Here, cover your gates. All you need is water and light. We can plant, we can put our fabric over any angle from 90 degrees to flat. As long as you get water and light, you'll plant. We can do sexy, innovative shapes, very Germanic, this one for Jaguar Land Rover at their, their HQ in, in Twickenham. And this is one of my favorites because cover your buildings with plants. It's easy. Um, this is a, a, a thing for another day, but our system is so versatile, we've, we've invented a new way of covering lampposts with, with it and, and, and having it powered by the sun. It's, it's, it, you know, we got the base of something very special here. Um, this is uh, interior wall in Seville, very wow. And this, this uh, is in Malaga, and it's one of my case studies that I'll come on to, but I love the way they've combined the core and steel with the plants. This, this is uh, one of my favorites because it's just a hive of bees um, in, in, in the summer. It's one of our porter cabins. And, and you know what? All plants will clean the air. That, that's important. They, they'll all do it. Some do it better than others. Some are better at trapping particles than others. But we're about biodiversity. I think the key message for me is putting living walls up is kind of easy <laughs> for us. We've been doing it a long time. Choosing the right plants to do a job is, is, is where we get quite interesting. And this is a wall we put up for AstraZeneca. Um, I'm sorry, they sent me up to take pictures and the arrows fencing was still up, but um, AstraZeneca wanted to use a cutting edge technology. So they used us. Um, and this one, so I, one of my favorite, I go, I go all bleary eyed at this one. This is a robin in a living wall raising its brood. That's what we want, right? We've spent so much time pushing our biodiversity out. So I hope that's given you a flavor of what's achievable with living walls. So now there's a few case studies to, to get into some nitty gritty. Uh, this was the um, video footage of the scissor lift. Um, and I think the, I'm not sure if you can see, see my, my mouse here, but this pipe here uh, takes rainwater, the orange pipe takes rainwater from the roof and it puts it into a tank. Uh, this is kind of big for us because I would imagine you get a bit of rain in Melbourne, Grant, but you, you know drains will take the rain out to see pretty quickly. And in this country, we've got flooding, flooding issues. So the Victorians were great at doing this. Let's get the water out of here. Now we want to hang on to it because it, it's crazy to me that we have to spend money to bring water that's gone through a filtration process back to water our plants. But anyway, I'm, I'm off on one now. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, this goes into rainwater harvesting tank. Here's your substructure that is entirely necessary to keep, create the air gap, as I said earlier. Um, and in our next slide, we should see our fabric going on, which you do. And then importantly, when, when you put irrigation onto a living wall, you will always get a little bit of runoff at the bottom. And if you can see in this last picture, um, there's a gutter at the bottom of the living wall I don't know if you can you see that grant bot, bottom left. I'm not sure. Um, basically, the water that comes out the bottom of the living wall, the runoff irrigation goes back into the same tank 
and pumped onto the wall. And it's one of the first walls in London that's that's fed entirely from harvested rainwater. And you see the main picture of planting is straightforward. The pockets are, are built into the system. You take the plant straight out of the pot, out of the pot, put it into the pocket. Now there's a there's quite a few living wall systems on the market. Some are hydroponic, some are soil based. Hydroponic is soil less, by the way, um, and that was first invented by NASA. Ours is semi-hydroponic, and it's been built uh, on the on, as, a, as I said earlier on a more engineered. Um, uh, framed than Patrick Blanc, so we, we have to control the water going and it's stronger. Um, but the same reason we, we can put the plants in quickly and the plants go then looking for the water in the middle of the fabric and the irrigation is delivered to the middle of the fabric. And it's really clever, it's, it, it, it's designed for long-term health of plants. Now here's a couple of slides of the Metro building Hammersmith. And when I was putting the presentation together, I said to my wife, what do those two pictures show you? And she, she has absolutely no idea about the biodiversity value in the bottom one. Obviously, that's, that's my strength. The design's quite good, but they're all native plants and they've got high biodiversity value. And she simply said, I would go to the place on the bottom slide. I would not go to the place on the top slide. And the takeout from that is living walls still offer that wow factor. And especially now we're finding in London that high streets are thinking of all these inventive ways of getting people to come back in to the town. You can't get away from the fact that living walls will increase footfall, along with all the other benefits, obviously. That's an important point. Now, my next case study is our woodland wall which you saw a video of early. And this was uh, out of our sort of innovative um, come out of your comfort zone uh, challenges that, 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 that um, yeah, I don't know if you can see all of that. Um, so the, are both slides up, Grant? I'm missing. Yeah, the, <clears throat> yeah you, the second one's over, to, um, over the front of the first one. Okay, well, so really uh, explained earlier, we want to see that you know, in theory, if roots can spread throughout the whole wall without damaging the building, they can jump from panel to panel. Can we support tree growth? So we're in, we're in year six now of a 10 year proof of concept where we've got roots and birch and pyracantha. Uh, we've got a forest on the side of a building. Now that's really special for us. We, we wanna see how big the trees grow. We're gonna copy some, some of them, um, but we're playing, but it's entirely possible. And if we're serious about bringing biodiversity in, you've gotta be able to put big plants in your living walls. Well, so gone are the days where, hey, we're clever, we can put a little plant in. This is serious stuff now. We have the ability to put some, some really mature planting on the sides of buildings. We do, indoor walls are important. Obviously they're not so big in biodiversity, but they're good for biophilic design and they make us humans feel good. But it's a few, really two criteria, same for the outdoor walls, water and light. The trouble is, Indoors, you need to make the light and you need to get the water there. So if you're gonna put a wall up where there is no natural light and no water, you've got to think on your feet. So here you get, you can get, say you put the frame up and in this case, we use the timber frame because it's inside, keep the fabric away from the wall and then you build a bench at the bottom, which is clever, but the bench is dual purpose because it's hiding the irrigation system. Now Grant and I had a had a long chat about um, the irrigation. Uh, hold on, because here we go. Um, we call this a recirculating system. Now that we get we lose something in the language here. So we got to, you can see the tank. Uh, so you've, you've got to fill the tank up with water. If you know that's a manual exercise. The water from the tank goes on the wall, and what runs out the bottom of the wall goes back to the tank via a gutter and a a downpipe. We call that a recirculating system. Grant, for some strange reason, calls it a retriculating system. So I think it's the same, I think it's the same it's thing, the same. Grant, but, you know, but it, it, in all seriousness, that, you know, the water gets to be recycled and, and that's important. And then obviously light is important. If you haven't got natural light, you need to put some lights in um, to allow the plants to photosynthesize. You can see the lights up at the top. Now, that is a whole area of expertise. So you, you don't want to go walking around with a lux meter because that does absolutely no good. Lux is what us humans need. What you need to be measuring is the PPFD. And the PPFD is the, 
uh, I'll tell you, it's a photo synthetic photon flux density. I mean, try to say that after a few wines. Um, but that is the measure of, of the type of light that plants need to survive. It's, it's, a, it's a red and green light. And when we started with interior walls, this was all kind of cutting edge technology, but, and, and the lighting choice was dreadful. But you can see up here on the, on the this is uh, Arup uh, HQ in, in London in, in their foyer. Um, uh, you can see the lighting doesn't look too bad, so there's much wider choice of lighting. So I'm not sure what you've got over there, but, but um, it's, it's getting better here. And if you look through the doors, I think we've cut the picture off. There is a Scottscape van outside the foyer doors. I noticed that when I was putting this uh, presentation together. Anyway, you can you can you can, um, you can put some very impressive in. That was a small wall, but all the theory is the same. Um, you, you can light water, and then you go as big as big as you can. So um, Chelsea Flower Show. Uh, it was obviously lovely. Chelsea Flower Show is where I where I served my apprenticeship. It was lovely going back there. Uh, I think we've missed a slide. Can I try and go back? Uh, hold on. Um, there's an artist's impression. Yeah, I think it might not, come not up. Not come that. through. No. Yep. I think it's oh, okay. Um, all right, so uh, Chelsea Flower Show, we were asked to dress the main gates to the Chelsea Flower Show as a, as a set of curtains. So we had an artist's impression to follow. So you, you get the drill. You've got to build a frame to hang the fabric. And here are the, here are the, two, here are the two pillars. And then you've, got to, then you've got to plant it up. This is nail biting, right, with the delay. Can you see anything up yet? Yeah, yeah. So the, you, you, you planted versions come on. Now your artist impression has come up. Oh, there so you go. There like, you go. Yeah. That, there's the finish. So again, yeah, lovely, lovely job. Obviously, lovely, lovely for me to get back to um, to Chelsea and and do my bit and say, hey, look at me, look what I've done with with my tools on the tube. Um, but anyway, you can see this is the this is a big thing. Whenever we get an artist impression, the first thing we look at is have we built what the artist did because that's the first impression that you get anyway this one this one worked out well um so incredibly versatile go around any shape you're getting the message don't be frightened of living walls as long as you get water and light there it'll work now grant did say you know he's, he's become a bit australian he said hey we do things bigger and better than you and we get hotter weather and you know will this work over there so um we we Put a case study together in Malaga. Now I'm not sure the extremes of temperature you get, but in Malaga it gets to 45 degrees uh, centigrade. Um, here you see the living wall going up. It's covering an existing building, um, and I think there's a there's a takeout here for me. Just, just a slight diversion is that living walls are quite pricey, mainly because of the, the, the getting access to build them, and they're they're also Kind of with retrofitting, you've already built a building and then you're putting another layer on, on the outside. So it gets even more expensive. If you can get in at design stage, why aren't we turning the rain screen cladding, which looks amazing. You can put lovely steels and ceramics and glasses and make your buildings look amazing. Why aren't we putting living walls as rain screen cladding? We, we did a, um, a white paper with Plymouth University, which came out last week, which has provided the data that a living wall without any insulation, just a living wall with plants, will increase the U value by 31%. So that, that means you do not need to heat your building as much as you would if you didn't have a living wall in it. And more than that, in hot countries, because they, they not only provide U value, they, they put the fabric of the building in shade, it makes a 50% difference. And more than that, you're gonna tackle the urban heat island effect, aren't you? Because you don't have that heat radiating back off the building. So anyway, this is a very hot, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm from Scotland, this is a, a very hot project. But more than that, it's by the sea. So the sea is just around the corner. So not only is it getting up to hot, we've got salt in the wind. It's very exposed. So um, sorry about the delay. You can see the cherry pickers and the fabric going up. It'll be second nature to you soon and then you get then you get planting see plants going up in in the top right here they here they go going so as far as efficiencies go 
the, once the fabric's up, that's almost a carpenter's job because it's got to be neat and tidy. You put the irrigation in, get the plants delivered, pop them in. It's an amazing experience, especially working at height. Sorry, I'm having to live with the delay. Right, here we go. Here, so here's the finished product. Um, and I, I think that's amazing. So it's all neat and tidy, prim and proper. Uh, you can see the swells in the design. And I think uh, going back to cost, our clients typically, I think 95% of them say, I want a wall that looks big straight away. I'm, I'm kind of in the other camp. And if you want a cheaper wall, plant smaller plants, watch them grow, watch them evolve into shape. So you have the flexibility with this system. Once you put it up to put small plants in or you put big plants in. So that's in 2017. I'm putting my money where my mouth is now with these years. In 2020, I'm not sure, so, or 2019, so two years later on, we're still living, right? We're, get, we're, we're getting a bit more mature on the planting. And the final slide, I hope will come up in a minute. Um, 2020. So, so now you're seeing th this is this is year three, and and it's still looking good now. So we need I need to get an excuse to go down to Malaga and take some more pictures. But there you go. So, it provided you get the irrigation right and the plant choice right, we're not worried about the heat. I think we've got some questions at the end, which was one of which is how cold can you go? So we'll, we'll answer that. So we we can go minus 25 degrees Celsius, and we can go plus 50 plus 55. Um, that we know about. So those are my um, case studies on, uh, and I hope that's given a, a a snapshot of the versatility and how. Don't be frightened to live in walls. Be like Patrick Blunt. Experiment. You you choose your plants. Talk to horticulturalists. And this design uh, consultancy and plant knowledge is is it can really be split into two. My first slide is. Um, the designs that our contractors work on when they're putting the walls up. Um, there's some bits they like, some bits they don't like, and I've picked the bit that they, they're not so keen on. This is the, the, the um, player major wall in, in Malaga. Um, so the design is on the left-hand side with the, the, the purple outline. So our designers have great fun with their Excel spreadsheet, put lots of pretty dots in different swells and, and colors, and then the client gets to see what plants they are and, and that that all works but our poor old contractors who have to put them in they, they'd rather have rectangles uh, rather than swirls um, but, but it's not it's not rocket science <laughs> these aren't motorways in 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 the uk by the way they're, they're actually plant choices but you get your spray paint out you make your shapes you know, it, it, you're not going to follow the design exactly. And after two or three years, all the lines have blurred. So it looks very pretty and exact when it's first planted. But when it matures, it, 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 it all softens down. Um, but that's how we set out on our living walls. If, if it's a curl, as I said, they'd much rather rectangles. And you've got to start somewhere. This is a job just kicking off and it's up to the uh, the team that's planting it to decide where to start. But when you get a time lapse of a living wall being planted, it's amazing because you're going brrr, so long. Anyway, for a man of my age, that's I find that fascinating. So the next bit of uh, plant, and this this is where it gets um, it, it's not when I started all those years ago. If someone wanted planning permission, the landscape architect would draw bit of green for a grass and a tree, typically. And the, and the planning people say, great, you've got some landscaping there, you can build your building. Now we're being asked, what plants are you putting in? What are they going to do? How much carbon are they going to trap? How much particulates are they going to trap? How much biodiversity are they going to bring in? Uh, how much ozone are they going to put? And it's really technical. Now, I'm, I'm not going to answer all, all, all your queries on, on this, but to let you know, we have that knowledge, you have that knowledge. iTrees is a fantastic bit of software that tells you how much carbon a plant's going to trap, how much particulate is going to uh, going to absorb. 
so for us, you know, me, biodiversity, we have, we have our, uh, a list of um, biodiversity plants that we've, we've, we've developed a bulletproof list. So we've been working with them for nine or 10 years, but we've, we've had to have trials. So we have, um, you know, you do have some plants that don't like it as much as others. So we will share this knowledge with, with Grant and City Green, but work your own, go and find the plants that are gonna bring biodiversity and try them out. We won't, we won't progress this unless you, a bit like Patrick Blanc, go and, go and try out what works. Don't be frightened of failing. You only learn if you fail. Um, on particulate matter, tra uh, tra 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 particulate matter trapping plants, um, there's a few tips actually um, that you might find interest. One's the street canyon effect where it, in cities where you've got lots of hard surfaces, a wind will come over the roof, hit the building, bounce down, pick up the pollution, it will go around in, in, a, in a big swell. Now, with um, when you're designing the walls, you can combat this, because this is not great for us as humans. We're breathing in this smog, it goes round and round and round. If you put living walls on, they act as filters. Now, typically a, a plant that traps uh, pollution has sticky, waxy, hairy leaves, but we found out that if you can get a different topography of plants, you get really tall plants or really small plants, that is the best way to, to trap particulates. And as the street canyon effect goes round and round, it's going through the wall, the wall is filtering the air. So there are, as I said, the we're big into biodiversity, but there's loads of benefits plants bring. So the, the, I think you're, I'm not sure if I'm talking to architects or designers, but see what the client wants, see what, 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 what they want to achieve with walls. And then we've got the knowledge to give them what they would like. Ah, oh, here's the plant knowledge coming through. I thought this slide was earlier. Here we go. So um, some plant, all plants do good, as I said, plants with, complex leaf structures or or waxy hairy um, sticky leaves are much better at trapping the particulars that's 2.5 to 10. Um, so as well as getting the topography right in in the wall you should be using this type of plant so, and the reason these are better at trapping particulars so if you have a, a a big leaf and the wind comes along the wind will hit the leaf and bounce off but if you're going into waxy hairy sticky complex leaf structure the the particulars going to get trapped in the leaf structure so that's a, a kind of useful hint for you and then when the when it rains the particulars will drop into the compost where the good bacteria will gobble them up so you know it's a combination of using the right plant choice for the right situation and that depends on what you're trying to achieve with your living wall so we've got statues here we've got heather We've got some bucks. There's obviously a Scots pine, one of my favourites, as you can imagine. There's a carex and a, and a camellia, but there's quite a few. And this is the old knowledge that we have. So here we go, waxy, hairy, sticky leaves. Maintenance. All living walls need maintenance. It's not a dirty word. You go, if you, you've got a horizontal border, you're going to need maintenance. That's it. The, the message for, and it's not difficult maintenance, we would say typically twice a year, you should be um, tending your living wall. But where we fell down the early days, and the wall on the right was a wall we built in 2010 or 11, Grant, it might have been when you were with us, but that's an well, iconic well, shot well, of... Uh, it's a while ago, but the, the, and, and you know, the abseilers bless them. <laughs> you wouldn't catch me doing that, but it's expensive. It's crazy. What? So we all thought, oh, it'd be great to have a living wall up there. But then they thought, well, how are we going to maintain it? Well, we've got to use abseilers. Well, that's expensive. And we find that some living walls get value engineered out of schemes because the maintenance is expensive. So if you're designing one, think about accessibility, whether it's a scissor lift or a cherry picker or, or, or a hoist. Um, is, is really important, but you, you, we've got to get water to them and they've got to be pruned. And I think the difference with a living wall and planting in a border is that when you put walls on a building, if there's a gap, people go, oh, there's a gap. But if you go in a border, you can see the soil. So it's kind of, you will get gaps. It will, it moves. But if, if the client's expecting a really full wall, like the wall on the right, that needs more maintenance. So that comes with the territory. But that's the football pitch that I said earlier we're playing in. 
we have the abilities to um, do these wonderful things with plants and put them on walls, but they need maintenance. And that's the cost of bringing biodiversity into towns, right? So I've pretty much at the end, there's a few key takeouts. So I think the, the real point of this webinar is to say living walls are not complicated. There's a few obviously basic things, get the irrigation there, choose the right plants. But, but all we've done is what Patrick Blanc has done, what nature does, we've given a substrate which will hold the plants. Um, you, as long as you've got water and light, you can pretty much do it, whether it's inside or out. You have the ability now, and we are being asked to, put plants in to do a particular job. That is that is just where the world is going, and it's right too. And we we, we obviously, <laughs> we love this wall. It's been, I think it's, the wall has been designed with the health of plants, but the, the plants aren't held in cells where they're, they're, the roots are conf confined. The roots go where they want. And for me, that's the biggest plus. Uh, the second biggest is it's lightweight and flexible. And the third biggest is you've got access to irrigation. And as Grant will tell you, if a wall fails, pretty unlikely it's a plant choice because you, you respect the designers done their job. It would be mechanical and it's about irrigation. We have various sensors that can monitor it. But if every irrigation goes wrong in this system, you can access a pipe because it's at the front of the system. And that's why we designed it that way. So we've worked with all the other systems. We like this because it's healthy plants. We, we plant for long-term plant health. It's a little bit corny, but the future's bright, the future's green. I think all those years ago, it seems like yesterday when I headed down to London, someone told me the streets were paved with gold and I went down with my cat and my bag. Uh, I can tell you they're not paved with gold, but maybe, just maybe, the value is in making them green. And that's the, the end of the presentation. We're really looking forward to working with City Green, giving you all the help you need to get get walls up in your neck of the woods, Grant. And I've, I've got a, a short video which should put together by a good friend of mine at WATG, which will show you how easy it is to put living walls up and green. He says pressing the button and nothing's happening. Do you want to do uh, it, Grant? Can you yeah, get it? There we go. There we go. <clears throat> great. Well, thank you very much, Angus. That was that was really, really interesting, really interesting points. What a great resource. Um, we move into some Q&A now, if we go through the questions. As I said, I've got a bunch of questions that were pre-submitted. And I'm just checking the chat function. We've got a couple in there as well. So we start off, and I'll just ask these to you, Angus, if that's okay. As long as they're not too complicated, Grant. <laughs> yes, let's hope not. So exploitations of the system in minus 20 degrees Celsius. So, so the system, has been put in a deep freeze for a long period of time. So um, there is no, um, it, it's been tested to minus 25 degrees and uh, plus over 50. So we, there's a huge temp swing. So the system will stand up. You've got to choose the right plants. So if you, you know, and that's down to each country that will work in the horticulturists will know. I, I think I just raised a point to, so in the early days, we up in Birmingham, I think you're with us. We had a living wall where there was a, an irrigation leak. And it was it was just when I was getting excited about living walls. I went up to Birmingham and the whole wall was just a sheet of ice. I was going, oh no, you know, this is we're doomed. This is not gonna work. Everything survives. So I think bear in mind that if you've got a heavy, heavy frost, I know you probably don't, don't get that in Melbourne, but if you're in a cold no. place and you're <laughs> listening to this, the top layer of a, the soil will get frosted down to four inches. So you've got four inches in our living wall approximately of, of substrate. The plants will, will work through it because they, they're native, they work. So the system holds up, it's about the plant choice. Great. Yeah, I had to replace the solenoid valves on that frozen wall. I think that was the only damage was the, was the valves where they yes. all warped. Um, those okay, so how, all those, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How can they be kept alive in our hot, dry climate? So that would be a, a, a comment from here in Australia. Well, that's pr probably you're better versed as, yeah. as knowing so much about irrigation, but it, it's irrigation, isn't it? The, you, the more we, we can get very technical, sorry, I'm, I, I can ask, <laughs> try and ask, but you, we, we, irrigation is pretty simple. You're putting water to an area. So now the, the more zones you put on, the more clever you can be with what planting you can have. If you get the irrigation right, 
as you've seen with the Malaga project, because it was it is pretty inhospitable there. It's not just the temperature; it's a it's a wind factor as well. Plants will grow, so it's a, the the technical technicalities. And now we've developed sensors, and it's all very clever with an app, and you can make things happen, and so on and so forth. So um, it, it, water, hot countries, and water—that's all you need. And hopefully, harvested rainwater. Yeah, I think that our root volume helps with that. The panel has got a large root volume, so the this plants are stronger. It gives them more tolerance to the extremes and drought as well, because they've got more opportunity to hold on to some water. So, okay. How do we support the weight? Is it something that needs to be engineered? Yes. Yeah. That. I mean, yeah. you've seen the substructure going up. So we have a very light system. So it starts off when it's first planted at about 35 kilograms per square meter. But if you fast forward in 10 years later, you'll be it, you you top the scales at 50 kilograms per square meter, and that's the number you give to the structural engineer. You say this has to support 50 kg per square meter. That's fully saturated and mature. Uh, and, and that's, a, sorry, not my world, but that's an engineering job. So we have the engineer, engineers work out the fixings and the subframe. But the subframe is important. Keep keep the living wall away from the building by 50 mil, yep. two inches to get the air through. Okay. Um, have there been any living walls or living seawalls installed along the River Thames? And is this being considered? No, no not that I know. The, 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 case yeah. Stu yeah, the case study was about 100 meters away from the Thames, but there's no reason why not. Um, as long as, as I think if, if, the, if the tide comes up and covers it, the, the plants won't work, but um, no, I'm, and I'm not sure where that question was going, but um, mm -hmm. not that I know I, of. With not something we've ever come across to date, but possibly in the future. Okay. Uh, the proper selection of site and the maintenance of these assets. So you touched on that a bit earlier. Um, yeah, they all everything yeah. needs maintenance. Everything needs maintenance, I think, and it's costly. Uh, I just it's not that costly, but if, if you if you want to really if you want a really well maintained border, you and you you can maintain it every month. But if you haven't got the side of a building, that's what it costs. So this is where I like the natural way, that the Patrick Blanc way. Put a load of species in there, and the best one will win, and, it, and it, because it likes it. And it doesn't need that much maintenance because it likes it there. Um, mm -hmm. Twice a year, I would say, is is your minimum. Autumn and spring. Um, and if you want it looking pucker, four times a year. Mm -hmm. so, so I think I, really, I think just, it, it, yeah. in design, I think it, we need to understand how you can't just put a wall 20 stories up and, and not worry about it. We need to understand how we're getting back there and what are the cost implications of getting back there. Road closures, big booms, cradles. Yeah hoists, that kind of thing. So just a little bit of thought at the front end um, and then maintaining the assets. Yep, you need you need a highly qualified maintenance team to understand all the horticultural needs. Um, yeah, so, so water that, saving. Yeah, but, yeah go on. Yeah, sorry, can we move on? Or uh, uh, yeah, on? yeah, yeah, no, move on. Yeah, you've, 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 you've hit the nail on the head. So water saving, water saving systems are used for irrigation. And I'll answer this one, and it kind of relates back to the other one as well. We can mitigate the risk on maintenance as well by monitoring these walls, so we know what the flow rates, what's happening, if they've been turned on and off, etc. So we we can understand if there is something to worry about. Our the the system we have, the living the city green living wall system, it's got a bit of longevity in because it can store quite a lot of water per panel. We're looking at two to three meters a square meter from an irrigation event, which will stay there. Um, and then water saving. We can adjust the amount of emitters we use, the, the flow rates of those emitters, when we irrigate the plants that we use and, and different aspects of the wall. So one part might be very wet, one part might be very dry if it's on a large building and we've got the sun moving around and shade to deal with. So that's we manage water that way. Once the wall's in, it will be watered quite heavily, but after it's a bit more mature, we can reduce that right down. So we, we have a little bit of runoff because yeah. we don't want the salts to build up, but not too much. Yeah, and and Grant, I've got to say, Grant was our irrigation manager, so this is his his uh, expertise. But we we did uh, on some challenging locations in in very windy streets. We uh, and this is the joy of working with the fabric system. We were able to uh, involve another material called Aqua Ten, which has good water retention properties. So if you've got a really really challenging job, there's ways around it. We just got to think outside the box. What design challenges do you foresee in mitigating climate change? 
for me, it, 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 if you the design challenge is getting a building which can take trees growing out the side of it, because climate change uh, and trapping carbon is kind of the, the big thing, it, it, as well as biodiversity. So if we can get trees growing out the side of buildings, you're well on your way to uh, helping. I think obviously we're not going to fix the, the climate change issue by what we're doing with living walls, but we all got a part to play. So bigger plants on the side of building is going to have more benefits. And I think that would be the design challenge. Uh, it's a bit like with a with a green roof. You, we can put sedum on, but if you want to have a really lovely roof, you've got to have, have more substrate. But to have more substrate, you need more structure, more structural integrity to the building. So um, it all comes down to what the building is going to take. And, and convincing the clients, that's going to look amazing. Yeah, I think legislation as well by governments and, and LGAs to to push more greening room buildings and, and make it compulsory in some respects so that we don't have these big open spaces. Are you, are you finding that down there, Grant? Is there, is there a we, is there a drive? To, the, obviously, you're going into this market, but is there, is there, is there, is there the local <clears throat> authorities pushing it? And if they so, are what are they? It it's just, they are pushing it. And so you, you're kind of, you you are. So your buildings will go in and get kicked out because there's not enough greenery. And then there's a lot of greenery on them. And it's just trying to understand how you're going to get it to work. Um, fire issues, that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. a bit of bit of work in the background. We kind of need to work with some government authorities. And um, there's another one next here. Questions: What are the irrigation options? I think we've covered that. So we like to monitor all of the projects. So ideally, we have a monitoring system on every wall. That doesn't always happen on small residential projects that don't need that kind of monitoring. Um, we can put different emitters in. We've zoned the walls as highly as we can, but again, on small projects. We need to see flow. So on really small projects, we can't chuck loads of zones in, but generally we're dealing with a smaller space. Um, next question, what is the strategy of dealing with rodent, rodent infestations? Now, I think I know where this has come from. There's a project in Australia, which there's rumors that there's rodents in the project. I don't know how true they are. It's something I've never, I've never seen myself, and I don't think you have, Angus. Um, I think, it, it's like any rodent infestation, you need to understand what, what, how they do, how they're getting in there if they are, and um, and then dealing with it that way. But maybe leaving think, green walls yeah. away from the borders, up off the ground, reducing the opportunity for rat runs, I suppose. I think it's a good, it's a good question. No, we none of all the forty-two thousand meters we've got have, have not ha, ha, had this problem. But I, I think if there's a rodent infestation, then. Um, you deal with it as you would if it's a problem, as you would on the ground, and you have to you set traps or use biological controls. But I think mm. to to stop me going up, don't don't maybe don't have the living wall coming all the way to the bottom and keep it in from the size of the building. Um, you know, and I'm I'm not using the argument that uh, rodents are part of biodiversity. <laughs> because I think that's pushing it a little. Bit. They are obviously, but uh, there's, there's there's a balance. But um, I think it was David Attenborough said that he actually couldn't see the point of a rat. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I'm not not going there, but yeah, it, it could be a problem. Um, but I think, yeah, there would have to be controls put into the wall. Yeah. Okay. There's only a couple couple left here now. Um, tips for successful green walls in a dry climate. I think we've covered that. I think root volume and irrigation um, and monitoring to mitigate any risk there. Um, okay, so next, interior installations yeah. have different temperature and light situations. How best to overcome this condition? Well, the, the, the interiors are much easier than exterior because you're dealing with a, a constant temperature and, and also you're dealing with tropical and subtropical plants that don't need a lot of nutrients. You just got to remember, don't measure the lux, measure the PTFE. So th that's, that's the bottom line. We find li li interior living walls are much less problematical the yeah. exterior because you're dealing with a, a constant temperature <clears throat> yeah there's no extreme straightforward yeah 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 a lot is because you can control the light you can control the Correct. temperature and so, it, it's important to note actually that the the, the lighting is really great but plants need a rest you can't leave the lights on all the time you've got to mimic daylight so they need at least eight hours of darkness otherwise they they, they totally get confused at what they're trying yeah, to do yeah. so rest is important and that's important to know because some offices like their lights on all, all night so uh, that's probably the biggest challenge. Okay. Um, and what is the process for specifying and sourcing plants that deliver multiple benefits, such as biodiversity and air filtering? Well, I, 
yeah, I, I've I've covered this. But the information's there. You just got to find the plant it. Yeah. yeah, you have to pick a pick a plant to do a job, uh, and that's quite exciting because you get to do that. Hmm. And the last question we've yeah. got is: Is this system from Scottscape the same as City Greens? And yes, it is 100%. So it's the it's the same system manufactured by Terapia Urbana um, and City Green are the distributors for Australasia and North America. And we're here and to Angus, uh, Angus has uh, yeah, Angus we, the UK, Europe. Yeah, yeah, but 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 it's for 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 me. I see it is is a big team because our knowledge is your knowledge. So what we've learned over the last 12 years working with the system, because we helped develop it and we developed for particular reasons, that this is your knowledge. Our passion is, we, we want to share, and that's why we're really looking forward to working with you um, right. down there and, and, and making a difference. So, yeah. Okay. I think that's it, unless there's any more questions that are going to pop in. I think we are done. So again, thank you, Angus. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for taking the time to help us here today. And thanks everyone who's listened in. I um, hope you've had some, some useful information from that. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for making making time to listen. Very, very appreciative to my ramblings. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.